Hello there. Welcome to episode number 13 of Little Big Knits. My name is Selma. You can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Little Big Knits. And we also have a Ravelry group on Ravelry called Little Big Knits if you feel like joining us. You will find the show notes there and we have an ask away thread there and you can introduce yourself there if you like. Um, and we have other goings on there as well, like a knit along, which I'll talk about later. So welcome everybody. If you're just checking me out for the first time, thank you so much. And I hope you'll enjoy what I have to share in this little podcast of mine. And if you're a returning viewer, thanks for coming back. Hello again. So we are today, I have no idea. Uh, it's February 17th. Last time I podcasted was, podcasted was January 7th, I believe. So it's been... Um, almost a month and a half and it has felt like that. Um, life has been really very busy in January and February so far. I think the last time I podcasted I said that January is going to be a month of getting back into the rhythm of things and um, so that and along with all kinds of other things and um, uh, relatives visiting from Uruguay, they're still here um, it's been very, very busy. And today is actually the first day that the house is quiet and there's nobody here. So I thought, and I have been dreaming about podcasting today. So, um, that's it. Here I am. You've got me no matter what. Everybody else is, um, skiing. Uh, we have my husband Alejandro and my two kids, Yaro and Ayla, and their two cousins, Santiago and Sebastian, and their aunt, Carolina are here from Uruguay. The three, the last three are here from Uruguay. I do live here with my husband and my two kids. And so they've all gone to Mont Saint Anne, which is just outside of Quebec City, a little bit further than Quebec City. It's about a six hour drive from here um, to go skiing. So they're there for the weekend and, um, and I am on my own. I didn't go uh, because I didn't fit. Uh, the car seats six people. We have a Mazda 5 and uh and there were six people going so and i don't ski because i have a very bad knee unfortunately because i very much like to but uh they're away so i am podcasting and uh, enjoying a weekend of quiet and getting the house in order and um doing things like that going to see some friends and so forth so so it's very very nice to be back you may notice that the podcast looks a little different not in terms of my setting my setting is the same for right now, um, the driftwood tree is there, no longer decorated, but it still hasn't moved. <laughs> it's still there. So now it's just an empty driftwood tree. I did think about putting shawls on it and stuff for today, but uh, it just didn't end up happening. Um, but we bought a Mac. Um, so the editing of the podcast will look different um, because I'll be using iMovie instead of uh, Movie Maker, which is what I was using before. Um, iMovie is a lot easier to use, um, although I do miss some of the look of uh, Movie Maker, but uh, it's a lot easier. I haven't done an entire podcast. This will have been my first time, um, and I can't really tell you how it went till later <laughs> and the next episode, but um, certainly I've done some practice uh, videos, and it's a lot easier to use than Movie Maker. Um, Movie Maker is a lot more difficult to learn how to use. I'm sure once you know how to use it a lot, it's a lot easier, but I found I need a lot more support to try and add things. And so I didn't. Um, so hopefully with this, um, new system, I'll be able to add, uh, you know, pictures and videos and things like that along the way. So yeah, so today I'm going to be sharing with you, um, a couple of FOs and I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm wearing. I'll tell you about what I'm working on. Um, we will do the uh, 2000 subscriber giveaway. And um, I'm just realizing I forgot the piece of paper for that over there. So I'll have to stop at some point and get that. Um, and uh, uh, we'll talk about our knit along, which is going really well, our garment galore cal. And um, I wanted to share with you some skirt math. Last time we talked about sweater math, and after I showed my skirt, 
Um, quite a few people asked me about how I had made it and went to my Ravelry page, um, which is sorely absent of information. I realize when I do modifications, I'm not very good at, um, at uh, putting them down uh, on black and white or you know in some format that's permanent. It's kind of in my head, maybe on the corner of a piece of paper, and then once it's done, it's kind of gone, and I'd have to analyze the garment again to, to get it. Oh, you've got a little bit of Yoda action again. <laughs> so anyway, maybe Yoda's just more active these days. I don't know. But we put that lambskin there one day just for some reason, I don't know what, and now she loves kneading on it. So anyway, and then if there's time at the end, I might show you a little bit of sewing because I am trying to get back into sewing. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the things that we are going to talk about today. Um, I'll do the subscriber giveaway a little bit later though in the show and we'll talk about the cow later as well. I thought we would just jump right into knitting. Hopefully I'm not forgetting anything. Um, I do feel a little bit out of practice, so if I'm clumsier than usual, excuse me. <laughs> so, mm, I'm drinking tea out of a wonderful Nicholas Moss cup that, um, or mug, this gigantic mug that Kate of Hawthorne Cottage Craft gave me when she came to visit for Rhinebeck last fall. And I'm drinking my black cardamom tea, my Ahmed black cardamom tea that I love so much. I think I showed you guys a box um, maybe three episodes ago or something like that. And uh, that's what I'm drinking today. But that makes me remember one person, um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that later, but one person in the 2000 subscriber giveaway in the comments, one person asked me, do you ever drink coffee? And I do, I do drink coffee, I love coffee, um, but I can't drink a lot of it, and I can only drink it at certain times. My stomach doesn't tend to um, like it very much. So I can't drink it in the mornings, especially if I've only had a smoothie for breakfast or something small. I usually have smoothies for breakfast. Um, I can't have coffee in the mornings, so I usually have coffee in the afternoons. Um, coffee is my afternoon delight and um, I very much enjoy it. I tend to drink it black. Uh, that's not my preferred way, but I just tend to drink it that way because I tend to have issues with dairy. So sometimes I'll have dairy if I'm in the mood to risk it, uh, risk my stomach getting upset, um, or I'll do almond milk or I'll just drink it black and usually in the afternoon. And I like my coffee strong and muddy just in case you wanted to know. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was one of the questions and I, I laughed when I saw that. So thank you for asking and here's your answer. So let's talk about, um, about finished objects, shall we? So let's start with what I'm wearing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am wearing um, the Mary sweater, although it's not a sweater, it's more of a tunic. Um, and what I'll do is uh, insert um, something here so you can see it in full length. So this is the Mary sweater by Marianne Bjerkman. Um, it's supposed to be a sweater. As you saw, I made it into a tunic kind of thing that I wear with nylons and high heels at work kind of thing. Um, so it's become, it's more of a work outfit. Um, it was meant to be knit out of bulkier, chunky yarn with a gauge of 14. My gauge was 18. I used hemp for knitting, uh, number 220 hemp wool, um, which is a Canadian yarn. Well, it's a Canadian company. I think she's located in British Columbia. Uh, but um, the yarn, which is a hemp wool combination, I think it's 65% wool, 35% hemp, is milled in Italy. And I've actually made two items out of this yarn because I love it so much. And you'll see later in the whips that I'm also um, making another sweater out of a hemp wool combination. It's a combination that I like a lot. Um, it's kind of, it's it, cause, it gives a sort of a heathery look as you can see. Um, there are little, you know, bits from the hemp that give it a heathery look. It's got the same feel as if you used wool with some linen in it as well. It creates um, a lighter yarn, so it's a little bit less warm. 
Um, there's a kind of a rusticness to it that I like. Um, and this has worn really well, um, this yarn. I made this in 2016, I think. Um, I have another sweater that I'll be showing you later on because I'm reworking uh, parts of it out of the same yarn that I made in 2011 and it still looks fabulous. So uh, I really highly recommend this yarn if you're ever interested in trying a hemp wool combination and it's a very generous skein. I think, uh, I think there are more than 220 yards in it actually, I'm not sure. Um, but very much like it. And I, I really love the color work on here. I, I think it's really, really pretty. And when I saw the sweater originally, I just loved it. But I didn't want to make something that was kind of more of an outdoorsy, lopey type of thing. I wanted something a little bit more sophisticated. So, um, so this is what I did. And for the yoke itself, I used, uh, I had a ball of um, Galway Heather in a natural color and that's what I used. I also had the uh, same yarn in uh, a natural cream color but it's got more of a yellowiness to it because it's got hemp in it um, and I, I found it too yellow. Like this is already yellow enough. When I wear, if I wear a white blouse underneath it looks really um, kind of more yellowy so I went for the Galway Heather and even though it's a different yarn it, it worked very nicely. So, so that's what I'm wearing today. Um, other than that, uh, last time I spoke to you guys, I was working on some socks for an employee at work. One of the people who was on assignment with our team for a little bit had won the draw at Christmas. Um, I have finished those socks and since given them to him and he was very happy and was wearing them the next day and was very excited about them. So I'm going to insert a picture here of the finished product and then I can, or finished item, and then I can tell you a little bit more about it. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, there seems to be a frog in my throat today. Um, I used an opal yarn that my friend Dana had sent me from Germany and I very much enjoyed working with it. It was, and I'll tell you why. First of all, I mean, it's a very, obviously a very good quality yarn. Um, it's a very solid yarn um, and I had expressed some concern about the ankles for this particular pair of socks because I was saying that um, he had very slender ankles as does my husband and I was concerned that they were going to bag. And what I had done with some socks for my husband is that I had actually after the heel, because I knit them toe up, I had actually <clears throat> done some decreases so that the ankles were more slender but I didn't really want to do this for a pair of socks for somebody else and I did the socks in a three by one rib all up from the foot um, on the front of the top of the foot and then on on the full round of the ankle um, I used mother regular needles that I always use a 2.25 millimeter um, I sort of tried to maintain a, a fairly tight stitch on it but I think the nature of the yarn, the, the strength in the actual yarn of the opal helped because it provides a bit more structure. And so even though he's got skinny ankles, they've kind of maintained um, and been perfectly fine. So I have a feeling that <clears throat> as I move forward and make socks for my husband, who has asked for another pair of socks, by the way, um, I... I will probably try and use yarn that has a little bit more structure to it. Um, I made him a pair of socks out of an indie dyer, you know, a, a lovely soft merino wool and they're completely baggy. But I have a feeling that using something that is not necessarily merino, that is a variety of fibers, uh, slightly more rustic, um, that provides a bit more structure, may actually help to maintain that shape in the ankle certainly one of the factors anyway. So, um, yeah. Now I just about always use the heel flaps from this book. This is a book that I've had for quite a while. Socks from the Toe Up. It's by Wendy D. Johnson. And I always use, and 
if you've been listening or watching for a while, you'll know that I always say that I use a gusset heel basic socks and her heel looks like that. And I use that because um, I don't tend to wear my socks out in the heel so much, but I really find that it's, um, it's a very easy heel. I remembered it and memorized it like that. Um, it fits really nicely. I prefer to have a gusset for myself. Um, I've done some short row and some afterthought heels and they're fine, but I prefer the fit. They're easier to get on. They stay on nicely on the foot. Um, I, I just like the look. So, but for Ray, uh, I don't know how he wears his socks. I know my husband, um, he's pretty brutal on socks. <laughs> And the heels can sometimes, um, he can be quite hard on them. So I thought for him, I always make him more of a heel flap. And so I used her pattern because again, I did a toe up for a, um, a slip stitch heel basic sock. So if you're looking for a book um, on toe up sock knitting, I really like this one. First, because she talks about three different ways of, of doing heels on the toe up. She, there's also the, the short row that she gives explanations for. So you've got three basic heels that you can incorporate um, if you're you know, making your own version of things. But there are also lovely patterns in here and I have made three, I believe. I made these dead simple lace socks for a friend at one point. Um, I made this one for a friend as well. And I made these ones for me a long time ago. Um, it's, um, let's see if there's a better picture. It's kind of a serpentine stitch. Um, this was a sport weight sock. Um, so I've made three of the patterns in here and there are more. Uh, and I like it because there are um, fingering weight ones but there are a few sport weight ones as well and there's just lots of lovely lovely patterns like these sort of Gansey kind of diamond stitch so um, so that's where I get my heel and I got my heel for for Ray socks as well the other thing that I have finished recently although I realized I had meant to recast it off and wet it and block it and all that jazz and then I completely forgot which blows me away because I was dying to wear it um, but uh, it's been a bit hectic around here let's just blame it on that shall we um, it was being housed and it won't be for much longer because it's now finished in my uh, bag ink bags um, which I so much enjoy and I've put a couple of pins on here the lemon says easy peasy lemon squeezy and the sunglasses say look on the bright side so I just love those and I got those at some point um, so this is you'll recall from a few episodes ago that I made the getting warmer cowl for a friend and I made it in the exact same yarn that I'd used for a sweater and so I thought really I shouldn't be keeping this because it's like almost the exact same it was a turtleneck even what I had made so I thought I should make another one, another color, but I really liked the purple. Surprise, surprise. And um, our local yarn store was having a sale. They have a warehouse sale once, once a month. It's called Wool Time Store. And they happen to have some purple alpaca by Estelle for a reasonable price. It was $4.99 a ball, which you'll see. <laughs> and it was the Estelle luxury baby alpaca DK and I thought well I still have more of the mohair and this is a stronger colored lilac-y purple um, and I, I cast off but then I was a little bit I wasn't totally sure I cast off on the wrong side like on the pearl row I wasn't hundred percent sure how I felt about that so now I have my version of this this is a thicker yarn than the one, um, than the alpaca that I had used before, which was the Sadness Garn Mili, Mili Alpaca, Mini Alpaca. This is a DK weight yarn. 
um, it's the ball is kind of at the end and that's what it looks like but it's a it's a, a stronger purple than the other one was the other one was much more mauvey and then there is the mohair and and there it is so I'm gonna finish that off today and wet it and block it so I can wear it unfortunately the weather's actually warming up quite a lot so we'll see it might be put away for the spring or I might wear it in my office because we moved at work into uh, another section and um, my new office is freezing cold people walk into it and they're just like whoa and I'm like I know and one day I actually had my hat my wool socks on and I was wrapped in a couple of shawls so um, so this might be a great thing to have at work to just put over um, if I'm cool if it's gotten too warm and I can't wear it outside but there you go it's a uh, such a great I, I would love to have one in in like a cream color and another one in maybe like a, a gray of some sort. It's kind of one of those things that I just like to have in a variety of colors so I'm curious I'm gonna be curious to try wearing it over a coat and seeing how that would be and you could also wear it under a coat but you'd want a coat that didn't close up too much because there's an awful lot of fabric here but it would be great to have something you know showing outside from out from inside of a coat there you go that's my other fo great great pattern really well explained super duper fun easy to knit i'd make it a few more times <laughs> i ended up using um the right size needles for it which i can't remember what they were and i used my lucke which worked beautifully six millimeter i think that's what we we're supposed to use and I had absolutely no problems with this particular pair. These are my interchangeables and I complained about them a little bit, but these ones were fabulous. And I really loved the color of the tip, <laughs> which is one of the reasons I chose it. So. So those are the things that I finished in the last month and a half. Um, I have to say, I kind of lost my mojo for a little bit. Uh, only a little bit because I am knitting stuff, but I just um, I just didn't quite know where to go and I ended up doing a little bit of sewing which I may talk about at the end of the podcast I just don't want this to end up being a crazy long episode So if it is then I'll perhaps not talk about the sewing this time and and leave it for next time, but um, I did eventually get back into it um, And so now I feel like I'm knitting all the things so the first thing I thought I would talk about, um, which is now being housed in here, because this was originally the Christmas cast on, I gotta be honest, I felt a bit weird walking around with a Christmas bag when it was no longer Christmas. So I said to Sue, because Sue had made bag, I'm like, you know what, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I, I, so I, I put it in this bag, which is by Lowland Originals. Um, she's a great bag maker on Etsy. And it's the socks that I, cast on at Christmas and I've been slowly working on these I I think the last time I showed you they were probably here so I haven't gotten a whole lot further I'm just ready to start the heel and I'll be using the basic gusset heel by Wendy D. Johnson that I just showed you uh, for these um, but boy I'm knitting these only at work so this is my lunchtime knitting when I happen to have time to knit at lunch so that happens maybe once or twice a week and I just I really love working on these I the yarn is and the the pattern combination has just uh, completely stolen my heart just love it love the way this is speckling this is yarn by Kristen of Volenvine yarns it's her blitz base it's it's a gold stellina I wonder if you can see the gold stellina I don't know might be too bright around here um, this is her blitz base, as I said, and the colorway is Enjoy the Silence. I think I called it Into the Silence last time, but it's called Enjoy the Silence. And I just, it's just so beautiful um, that I'm always thrilled when I can work on it at lunchtime. And uh, so I'll just continue plugging away. I've got way too long chow goo needles for this, but uh, I don't know. The other needles were all taken up by something. So these are the ones that I'm using. 2.25s. I still love them. It's still very fast because it's such such a smooth thing that it's just like whip whip and on to the next 
on to the next um, the next part of the row or the round so yeah really 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 enjoying um, did I tell you this is called the first star this pattern and it's by Jessica Gore and it's a very easy you're wrapping stitches the wrap rows are slow uh, I'll be honest um, and you get to them quickly because the rest of it is <laughs> is really easy uh, but it's such an effective pattern and I just love the combination so that's one width that's going along slowly but surely I enjoy every moment I work on those I just you know they're I'm leaving them as a, a work project The other things that I am working on in my bag by bags she built, um, I am knitting. This was the first thing that got, got me my mojo back, but then I ended up putting it aside um, a bit. But I have been wanting, I think I mentioned to you guys that I wanted to make uh, a color work sweater out of yellow and cream. I might have mentioned that at some point. Um, and it was really on my mind. And I had actually ordered this yarn before Christmas. I had seen it before going to Rhinebeck, but I didn't want to buy a sweater quantity at that point because I was planning on buying a sweater quantity when I went to Rhinebeck. But then when I went to Rhinebeck, I got sick and didn't go back the second day when I was going to actually do the majority of my purchases. So I walked away without a sweater quantity. So I went back to Wo Wabi Sabi, sorry, Wabi Sabi, um, which is another local and more local yarn store than Wool Time. Wool Time is further away. Um, and they still had the yarn, the yellow yarn that I had seen, but not enough of it. And then I was like, oh, but I really, really wanted to use this yarn. So it's, it's Gailsk. It's, I believe it's a it's also made in Italy, but I believe that Gailsk is either a Danish or Norwegian company. I'll put it down on the down bar there. I'm not quite remember. Um, so it's, it's again, a wool hemp blend. Also 6535. I really think that it's actually milled in the same place as the, um, the uh, hemp for knitting yarn is. Um, it just, when I looked at it, I was just like, this feels like the same stuff. Um, so they had had this yellow stuff yellow yarn um, and as you can see it ends up with a very heathered look because of the hemp in it um, but they didn't have enough but Emily who works there was so lovely and kind and said oh we can order some for you so or I asked could you order some and she said sure so they ordered some and it arrived um, soon after I podcasted last time and so I got it and then I was narrowing down which sweater I was actually going to make with it and then trying to figure out which yarn to do for the color work. So I actually, oops, there's a bit of a mess here, ended up using the hemp wool. There's the kind of the label with the, with the price at the time. It was $12.99 for a ball. I don't, I'm not even 100% sure. I got this at, wool, at uh, Wabi Sabi, but um, so as you can see there, the hemp wool and this is the cream that I used for a sweater that I'll be showing you later and so I am making a sweater out of those two I swatched with this which is more yellowy than this so I swatched with both of these yarns with that and the effect was definitely more crisp with this one but I kind of liked the slightly more subtle aspect of, of that so I started it and then I got distracted by something else. I'll show you the original sweater, uh, which is by Diana Walla. It's part of the Brooklyn Tweed series, and it's the Sun Sundotti, probably is pronounced something like that, right? I think, is it that the Sun Daughter by chance? I don't know. But um, I have uh, admired this sweater since it came out, and um, I just decided that's the one. That's the one that I want. I had a few other options, but that was the one that was really speaking to me. Now that is a bottom up sweater. And so I decided to try making it as a top down sweater. Um, and I've just started the color work. So my theory was, and somebody else confirmed this, um, Melissa of the Wales Street podcast, I think confirmed this that 
you can pretty much just convert what would normally be in a bottom up sweater um, where what would normally be the two togethers in the color work you can convert those to make ones so rather than decreasing you're increasing in the same places um, but I got nervous about whether this was really going to happen and I got distracted by my other sweater that I'll be showing you in a moment um, so I stopped but I'm gonna once I have finished that one I'll definitely getting back to this because I'm I'm really really loving the little bit that is there and it'll be a nice yellow sweater that'll probably look better in the fall when I've got a little bit more color to my face <laughs> um, yeah and there's some short row shaping on here um, to lift up the back a little bit and I'm using a wonderful little stitch marker that uh, Holly brought back from Holland. A bicycle, very fitting, and I really like it. So, um, so yeah, so that hasn't gotten a whole lot of love since I started the color work because I got distracted by the next project that I'm going to show you. But I'm very much looking forward to getting back to it. Sorry, just needed to have a little sip there. That's what happens when you talk a lot. And I really, really enjoy this bag that Tracy sent to me at one point. She has more like them in her shop and it's a great vintage tablecloth that she's used and I love the feel of it and it's a great size. So I use this very often. So my next distra distraction, um, and I think I got distracted by this. In fact, I know I got distracted by this because I was watching the uh, Fruity Knitting podcast, which is a podcast I very much enjoy. Um, they always have great interviews. In fact, I watched their most recent episode last night um, in which they interview a woman called the Shepherdess. I can't actually remember her, her real name, but <laughs> um, she is a shepherdess in uh, Cumbria and it was a fascinating interview and I really want to go there. She's, she's a really fascinating person so um, that's a great one to watch. But a couple of episodes back they were interviewing Isabel Kramer who is a, a well-known designer. She makes a lot of mostly top-down type sweaters, really simple modern designs and they were interviewing her and I was watching her and I was watching her bring out all her designs that I know so well because I admire them all and she brought out um, her Arwen sweater and when she did that I was like that's it I'm making that right now so I just stopped watching went and bought the pattern I hope I'm not the only one who does that and I'm making this and it's a yoked sweater which seem to be yokes are really in right now whether they're lace or color work and um, I have had this yarn sitting around for a while waiting to become something I have hemmed and hawed about what it was going to become for three years since I got it because I got it at the Malabrigo factory in Uruguay it is Malabrigo sock it was an experimental colorway which it's really unfortunate that they didn't repeat because it's a really beautiful purple. Um, it was in their extras. Um, there were four skeins of it. And I was like, oh, what's that? And the woman said, oh, that was some experiment. And I was like, well, I want it. The skeins weren't great. There were a lot of knots in them or a lot of breaks, I should say. Um, so especially in one of the skeins, there were like four or five little mini skeins really in it. And then there was another one where there were two and then the last two were fine. So um, I am using this, I've called it Violet Experiment. Uh, I have no idea what they would have called it. Um, and that is the color that I'm using. I am striping the skeins because they weren't, um, you know, it's hand dyed, right? Um, and you could noticeably see that some skeins were a little darker than others, but this is how it's going so far. I'm using 3.25 millimeter, millimeter needles. I'm very much enjoying, but it's not a fast knit. I'm, I feel like I knit a lot and I don't get very far. Um, it takes me about five minutes a row and I'm almost 
at the part where I'm going to do the ribbing. And the ribbing is quite a, quite a long ribbing, and I decided that I will make the ribbing quite long. Um, and it'll be a little bit more fitted uh, than her. She tends to make very loose fitting sweaters, but um, I decided to make it a little bit more fitted, but it'll still be a nice relaxed look. And um, I'm really, really enjoying it. I'm very much enjoying the yarn. It's, um, as I alternate the skeins, it's, it's making it very even, which is nice. And I was a little concerned that because of the variegation in this yarn that the lace work wasn't going to show so well, but I think it's going to be fine. Uh-oh, I think I have a needy cat coming my way. Really? So yeah, I'm very, very much enjoying this. Now, I can tell that my neckline is going to be much smaller than hers in the picture, and I don't know why. Uh, she used a different kind of cast on. I used a regular long tail cast on, as you can see. Um, now, she's a very teeny person. She's a very slender person, and I would say small, small boned, and I th I'm just trying to see she used a German twisted cast on, and I just um, used the long tail cast on, and I don't know if maybe that creates um, a smaller neckline. It's not tight. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, somebody asked the same thing about my branches and buds, and, and maybe it's the long tail cast on that helps to keep the neckline a little bit smaller. I don't know. But... Um, I'm really enjoying that knit. It's such, at this point, it's such a wonderful mindless knit as well. The lace was great. It was easy, well charted. Um, the baubles, because did you notice the baubles? The baubles were, rows were very slow. But there are baubles. It's going to be a sticky, outy sweater. <laughs> it's, gonna, it's got these baubles all around on three of the rows. So the top row, the bottom row, and then in the middle. Um, those rows are very slow, but uh, otherwise it's been a very pleasant knit. It's slow going because it's fine yarn and not a very big needle. I am keeping this in the trundle bag by Matterroot Maine that Kate had uh, given to me um, before Rhinebeck, and I just love this bag. And I went out, well went out, I didn't go out did I, I went online and ended up getting um, a pin by hmm, Nastia Sletsova, I believe is her name. She makes these beautiful, beautiful enamel pins. Usually she makes houses that are enamel pins, but she did this series, well, there's only one. She did this pin um, in collaboration with um, uh, Mandarin, um, Melody Hoffman who's a sweater designer, and this is sort of after her yoked sweater that she recently designed. And it's just beautiful. Her work is really beautiful. I, I would love to get one of the houses at one point because they're just stunning. Um, but yeah, so that, that pins on here. So I'm very much enjoying. That has taken up a lot of my attention. The last thing that I'm working on, can you believe how many projects I have on the go? I don't know what's happening to me. I am doing a test knit for Madeline Windsor, who is also known as Kingfisher Knits Online. And she has recently designed a pattern that is uh, in test mode at the moment called um, Kolihin. And so it'll be out once it's been tested and you can't really see a whole lot from my black and white photo uh, printout however this is a very interesting pattern and um, when she asked me um, I was happy to do it especially because there's mohair in it anybody who knows me knows I have a thing for mohair and on top of that um, there is yarn support for this particular test knit um, that I'm doing um, from stranded dye works so 
I was able to get yarn from Stranded Dye Works for, for this um, in this combination. And the shawl is made with three weights. So this is a fingering weight. <laughs> I should have done this before. This is in her Oasis base. And this is her P.E. Knickers colorway. It's a really beautiful blue. It's coming up a bit purple there, but it's a very rich blue. Um, and then there is her Kid Mohair base, which is her first frost colorway. And if you watch her, this is her, her beautiful gray. And oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. So beautiful. And then the third base that's being used for this shawl, it's very, a very interesting, is her castaway base, which is her superwash DK, and this is in glass slipper. So this shawl is a great stash busting shawl, and there are two sizes to it, small and big, or large. Um, and the large one uses all three skeins. So this is great if you happen to have a DK, a fingering, and some mohair that you think, those would look great together, but what am I gonna make with them? You could make this shawl. And it's just knitting up beautifully. I had a, a non-knitting friend over last night. She was just like, that is beautiful. So this is how it's looking at this point. And it's just beautiful. Just beautiful. There's something very ocean-like about this. I'm really, really, really liking it. In fact, I think she talked about... Um, the fact that this Colleheen uh, means um, ripple in Irish. And uh, with the colors that I got for this shawl from Amy, it really does look so much like water and ripples. So it's just beautiful. And it's, it's very entertaining because you've got different things happening all the time and you're changing bases and you're just watching the ripples go by as you knit. It's just beautiful. I've got to admit the mohair sections are my favorite. <laughs> I just There's something about knitting with mohair that I just love. The first sweater that I ever made, I was I think I started when I was 14, but I, I, I wore it in grade 10, um, which would have put me in the 15 category. And um, I've actually been looking for, I, there's a picture of me in the school hallway wearing the sweater and I cannot find it anywhere, it's driving me nuts. But there was that initiative on um, on Instagram about your first sweater, and I really wanted to post, but I just I have not been able to find it. But my first sweater was made out of gray mohair. It was just a very simple uh, raglan sleeve, and it was not a light mohair like this. It was more of a medium gray. Um, but I see gray mohair, and it just it just speaks to me. <laughs> and clearly, it spoke to me when I was fourteen as well. Um, that was probably not the easiest fiber to make your first sweater out of because I remember having to rip the um, the ribbing out a few times because I kept making mistakes and uh, but it worked so this will hopefully be done by the next time I podcast I'm knitting a little bit on it every day and a little bit on my R1 every day and once in a while on my socks but this is going to be lovely and I'll let you know when uh, Madeline is going to uh, publish the pattern. So it's really beautiful. Thank you so much, Madeline, and thank you so much, Amy, for what is turning into an evening treat for me to knit on this. Um, I'm really enjoying it. And Madeline has designed other shawls as well. Um, the Patrona shawl, you may remember, um, that's the one that sticks out most in my mind. Um, and uh, she's got some lovely designs as well, so check her out. This is being held in a bag that I made um, a couple of years ago when I was first starting to sew and uh, practicing zippers. And uh, it's a bag that I just really enjoy using. So that's it for whips. I'm going to take a little break here because I need to go and get um, the winner, the name of the winner for the um, 2000 subscriber giveaway and I'll be back to do that quick, quick. All right, so here we are again. So 
You'll recall that um, this was two episodes ago. I announced that we were going to do a 2000 subscriber giveaway. I asked people to, and thank you so much for your subscriptions, and there have been more since then. So I really, I'm just really pleased that people want to enjoy or want to watch and listen to me talk about knitting. But I really enjoy watching podcasts myself. I love hearing about people's musings and uh, regarding knitting and what they're doing. And uh, I especially enjoy garment knitting. So I tend to choose podcasts where there's some of that going on. And um, it's, I think, been such a great way to build community um, between Ravelry, Instagram and podcasts. I think the knitting community is really, uh, it's really thriving and um, dynamic. And so it's really fun. So I've been really enjoying doing this. Um, and so for the prize for the 2000 giveaway, I had announced that there would be this fabulous yarn, Mondim, which is 100% wool, but it's meant for sock knitting. And it's been treated in such a way that it is meant for sock knitting. Um, it's from Portugal. And this was donated by um, um, from Farm to Cables, which is an online store. Right there. And uh, so generously donated, so thank you so much. And um, it's such an interesting yarn. I feel like when I get my sock mojo a little bit back a little bit more, then it'll be, um, this is one that I'd like to, to try out. Another part of the giveaway was this Progress Keeper from Rin Textiles, as well as the Santa Lucia pattern by um, Anna Freiberg. And I realized I did not bring a copy of that. Um, so I'll insert a picture here. So that was the prize. And I asked everybody to comment on, um, you know, what they'd like to see in the podcast, what they've enjoyed in the podcast. So many fabulous, fabulous comments and questions. So I'll be addressing those little by little here and there. I've talked about coffee today. Another thing, another one that somebody brought up was, What's with this progress keeper business? Um, she did not understand the point of this. And I had to laugh because I kind of felt the same way at one point. But I do find them very useful um, when, for example, I'm trying to get to the end of a sweater and I keep having to measure all the time, I'll put a progress keeper and I know that, okay, I wanted to do about two more inches. So it's easier to measure from the progress keeper and, and visually see, oh, it's looking like I'm getting close to two inches. So um, I tend to use progress keepers, not all the time, but when I want to, to do that. Um, I ended up doing that uh, for the Arwen sweater, actually. At one point, I put I have a progress keeper, actually the Rin one, on the back. <clears throat> so that's what I'll use progress keepers for. Um, some people like to do it to, to, to be able to show how far they've gotten on something from day to day or <coughs> things like that. Yoda is not settling down today. So anyway, I uh, got out the random number generator and uh, and chose a name um, and or chose a number and it the winner is drum roll please Kathy I think it was Kathy Balcon cannot read my my writing who is Bocat on Ravelry so congratulations Kathy thank you so much for participating thank you everybody for participating there were 293 entries and lots of wonderful comments so I really really appreciate that uh, thank you so much for, for joining me on this journey. Uh, it's really fun. As I've said before, I think about podcasting a lot. So um, I'm really grateful to everybody for your enthusiasm and your encouragement. And um, I just find people very positive overall. And so it's really, it's really a joy to be part of this community. So there you go. Congratulations, Kathy. Um, if you get in touch with me, I will send that out to you and I will have Anna send out the pattern to you. For some reason, my throat is really scratchy, so I'm going to take another sip. <clears throat>
I also realized I forgot to show you another whip. It was an FO. I've worn it for years and now it's a whip again and it's in this basket by zigzag stitches. So I posted this a picture of me wearing this sweater with red lipsticks. It was a sexy picture. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I think. <clears throat> and this is a sweater I made in uh, 2011, as I mentioned. Um, it's the number 14 leaf yoke sweater. It appeared in knit one as a tank top. And a few people modified it and turned it into a sweater by adding some regular raglan increases here. So I really liked that idea. And I used the hemp wool that I've already mentioned for this sweater. And as you can see, like I made this a long time ago and it's just, I've never depilled it, ever. There's a tiny, tiny few little things here and there, but really, really minimal. It's been just a fabulous, fabulous yarn. But I made bell sleeves on this when I originally made it, and I grew to dislike them. Um, I just found they got in the way, <clears throat> and I kept thinking that I really should rip them back and knit just some straight sleeves. And then, because I've had this since 2011, you know, there's a little bit of dirt that has sort of accumulated on these on the little edges there and so when I posted that two weeks ago I thought that's it it's time to rip out the sleeves so I decided to start with one I unraveled it and turned the yarn into a ball <clears throat> picked up the stitches and started knitting now I'm not liking what I'm seeing because it's the right size. I'm pretty sure it's the right size needle. Here's another thing about me. I realize I'm not very good on Ravelry. I had put that I used 4.5 millimeter needles, but then when I, when I tried to put 4.5 millimeter needles on here, I realized, no, I could not have used 4.5 millimeter needles. I used four millimeter needles. So I think that the tension's fine, but because the yarn has already been knit, it's really not looking great and I'm not, I'm not confident that I'm going to get to the end of the, the, the sleeve, wet it and, and so forth, and then it's going to look like I want it to look. So I think I'm going to rip back, keep the stitches on hold, unravel the ball, or reskein it, and soak it and dry it, and then go back and do it. And I, then I think it'll be, it'll be a lot better. And if it isn't, I have the ball that I'm using for the color work on the Sundot here. I could probably use that because those balls are very generous and I don't think that I'm going to need, I really won't need all of it for the color work and I probably would have enough for the sleeves. So we'll see what ends up happening. I'm in it now so I've got to get it done. But this has really been a wonderful sweater. And I remember when I was making it wondering how this was going to sit, was it going to be floppy, but it's really, I think partly because of the structure of the yarn. This just sits really beautifully, this sweater. It's very flattering, very pretty. Um, I would make it again. <laughs> just really, really lovely. So that was the last thing that I was working on. <clears throat> I'm gonna take another little break and I'll be back. All right, so let's hope that my throat settles down and I realized I haven't sat properly in my chair. I've probably moved a little bit, but I wanted to talk a little bit about sweater math this time. I thought maybe that would be useful if you happen to be interested in making, not sweater math, did that already, skirt math. So um, I have made, I think, five skirts. Um, so three of them for me and two for other people. <clears throat> So I, and, and as I said, a few people contacted me last time, after last time, sort of saying, you know, there are no notes on your page, or it'd be really great to hear a little bit more about that. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about it. The first skirt that I ever made was this one. 
This was based on the Hill Country dress by Snowden Becker. I had made the sweater and didn't want to make the dress because I just wasn't confident about wearing a dress. But then I decided to make the skirt. Um, and I used Galway Heather yarn, which I had, which was brown, and I actually over dyed it with um, Wilton's icing paste uh, in the moss colorway, and it turned into this fabulous green. So I made this, and instead of bottom up, which the dress was, I made it top down, and I added a ribbing at the at the top um, with some increases. Now, don't do this, because <laughs> I'll tell you, the first time I wore this skirt, I had a nice cream colored sweater and nylons, and I came downstairs and I was making breakfast or lunch for the kids that day, and I looked down and the skirt was at my ankles. So. I realized at that moment that a ribbing that I thought was a little bit snugger on my waist was not going to keep a skirt up. So I went and I got two pieces of the wool and wove them through and just tied it on the side. Now I don't know what I've done with those pieces of wool, but that's essentially how I end up having to keep this skirt up. Not very sophisticated, not very attractive, but I always have something over um, and it works. Um, the next skirt I made, um, and so we're kind of talking about waistbands, <laughs> was this skirt, which was called the Blue Lagoon Skirt by Irina Anakina. Um, this skirt was made out of 100% wool and again, this was probably made about 200, 2011, and it's really kept up wonderfully. 100% wool is a wonderful um, is a wonderful material for a, a skirt, and it keeps up very nicely. This has to be hand washed. Um, this skirt, which is called the bamboo, what did I call it again? The ba the blue lagoon skirt, has this frill down here at the bottom. Uh, this one had a built-in drawstring. I ended up just using some of the yarn and putting some beads on the end. It's it's kind of sloppy, but again, it does the trick and it's got eyelets going around it so that you can, you know, draw that in and and it works really well. It has increases built into this um into the panels and then it's got this wonderful sort of fluting thing happening at the bottom. I really love this skirt. I made a second one of these for somebody at work. This was made out of a bamboo, cotton, and acrylic blend yarn, I don't even remember what it was, um, that I got from a de-stash of somebody's on Ravelry. And it's been great. As you can see, it just it just keeps its shape. Um, it's a drapey yarn, it's a little on the heavy side, but it's, it's worked well. And, um, you know, a drawstring waist is, is a good thing. By the time I got to the skirt that I showed you guys last time, I got a little bit smarter. Not by the time I got to that one, by the time I got to the second one of these ones, I made one for my mum out of a charcoal grey. Um, I ended up doing a folded waistband as I did for this one and putting an elastic in there. So there's an elastic in there. And this one was made out of a yarn that had a variety of fibers and I think I talked about it last time it has you know some mohair some wool some something else um, and so I think that this is probably the best waistline in a way uh, or a drawstring waistline but when you're gonna make a skirt you got to have some sort of a waistline or it's gonna end up at your ankles like it did for me that's not a very good look <laughs> I'm so glad I was at home when that happened. <laughs> anyway, um, and this is a great type of waistline where you knit, then you do a row of purl and you continue to knit and then you sew them in and you leave a little opening and you put an elastic waistband. It's a good idea when you're making a skirt um, to definitely think about what kind of waistband you want to make. So 
I'm going to try and be somewhat structured about this, but I can see I'm also already going in, in a variety of ways. So one thing I wanted to talk about was materials. I mentioned that already last time. I don't think I'd ever make a skirt out of 100% cotton because it's most likely going to end up sagging um, in the bum bum. And um, however, mix cotton with bamboo and acrylic as in the red skirt and you've got something that bounces back all the time. Mix it with linen and that works out beautifully as well. Mix it with wool or with everything else. I think that's fine. 100% um, non-superwash wool, which is what the green one is made out of, has worked really, really well and has been a lovely skirt. And on top of that, it's warm. I haven't made a skirt out of superwash wool. I've made a tunic out of superwash wool, which I haven't shown you guys yet. And that one seems to have been okay, but I, I can't pronounce um, my thoughts very clearly on that or uh, because I haven't made a skirt out of superwash wool. So I, I don't know how it would work. Generally, I would say that skirts should be knit at a fairly tight gauge, not like super tight. Um, and people sometimes worry about superwash stretching, but if you knit it at a tight enough gauge, it probably wouldn't. So superwash would probably be okay. Um, if you happen to have any experience with that, please let me know. So that's one thing about the materials. And the waistline we've already kind of covered. Generally, I start by knitting a waistline. So in terms of measuring, I talked a little bit about sweater math last time, and it's kind of the same principles. I do the gauge. This was made with a chunky yarn. I, I didn't keep any notes anywhere, so unfortunately I can't share what I did with this one, but it doesn't really matter because what I suggest is you take the yarn that you want to use, you do a swatch, make sure you like the fabric, like this has got stretch to it, but you definitely don't want something that's see-through. Like I don't have to wear a slip with this or anything like that. So you want a gauge that is not stiff, but um, not transparent, um, and that's going to you know keep the structure and the shape for you. Once you're happy with that swatch, then you're going to figure out your waistband. So let's say you've got a, a 30 inch waist. I would suggest casting on for an inch or two smaller because you know it's always going to stretch. And then what you have to do is figure out, and I'm talking about a straight skirt, okay? I'm not talking about an A-line skirt because that would be a different story. I've never made an A-line skirt. They're not skirts that I tend to wear. Um, I tend to wear straight skirts. Um, but then what I would do is measure the widest part. So probably somewhere around the middle of your bum, depending on your shape. If you happen to have very sticky outy thighs, I probably wouldn't go with that measurement because you're probably going to end up with something that's too loose in the bum. Or um, it's or you'll, you'll figure out your increases based on that. So you've got your waist, you've got the widest part of your hips. So let's say you're a 30 inch waist and you're going to a 36 bum, right? So you know that you have to increase by six inches between your waist and the widest part of your bum, your hip area, right? And let's say you know that it's about this amount. Now, I'm not good at, I don't tend to check row gauge. And I ended up having to modify things with regards to this one as a result of that, which I'll tell you in a moment. But generally, let's say your gauge is 20 stitches, you've got a 30 inch waist. So uh, 20 stitches um, divided by four is five, and five times 30 is 150. So you know that you need to start with 150 or less if you want to be a bit smaller in the waist. Or so let's say you have a 32 inch waist, but you want to make it 30. So you know you have to start with 150 and then you're going to have to increase so that you have enough stitches for about 36. Think about ease. If you want a little bit of ease, then build that in as well. I didn't really build it in because I knew that I wanted this just to be snug, not like tight, but kind of a zero ease. I knew that once I started knitting, I'd probably relax my knitting a little bit. It would be a little bit looser and it would be a little bit bigger and yarn does give a tiny bit. So I just did zero ease. And so, you know, I calculated to increase about there to my, to my largest point. 
And so normally I would just do the increases as you would for a raglan increase on the side. So you mark both sides. And then once you get to the widest part of your hip, you go down straight and you go down as long as you want to go. Um, and you do what you want to do with the bottom. This ended up being a sweater type skirt that goes mid thighs. It's a bit mini like I wear it with leggings or with tights. And so I just did a ribbing. I really loved this fluted edge here from this skirt. So you can see that pattern online. It's really wonderful. I had to modify that pattern because it was meant for DK yarn and she only used, I think she only gave one size or there was nothing that worked for me. So I had to kind of modify it. Um, but once I realized what she was doing, it was fairly, fairly easy to modify. Or you could choose a pattern like this one, the chevron pattern from the Hill Country dress um, that I really enjoy. So then you can just go to town. Now if you're going to swatch, make sure you swatch in your stitch pattern, whatever it's going to be. And so then you just go for as long as you want to go. And you do what you want to do with the bottom of it. And then you're going to want to, um, you know, cast off in a way that uh, is, is loose-ish so that um, you don't have any issues with that. And then I added in here, I think, a, a one inch elastic. And um, as I said last time, I marked the back <laughs> very sophisticatedly with a knot from some yarn just so that I knew what the back was because I made a bit of an error while I was making this. But I thought, oh, well, I'll just figure it out because I did not take into account row gauge. And because this is a big, um, it's a thick yarn, I would have needed to do increases more often. And so I decided, well, because I hate ripping back, I decided, well, why don't I do a few increases on the bum, you know? And so, so I had to mark the back of the skirt because it really mattered at this point. And so I think I did a couple of extra, um, increases along down the back so that it would go out a little bit. But that's not necessary. I did not do that on either of these skirts. This skirt was only increased along the sides and you can actually see the line going there. I probably could have made a smaller waist and increased it a little bit more dramatically. This one, the increases were done all around. You don't really see them, but they do, they are there when you're wearing them or when you're wearing it, you can see them and they were at you know, at the beginning of each ridge. Um, so you can just do the increases along the sides, but you can incorporate them into the back. After I talked about the skirt last time, somebody in the group uh, said she got so inspired that she decided to go for it, and which was very wonderful. And she was doing short row shaping for the bum. So that's something else to consider. I think it probably depends a little bit on your, on your shape. If you have um, a fairly prominent behind, you might want to keep that in mind a little bit more to support you. Uh, when I made this skirt for my colleague, um, I had to rip it out and start again because she had a much smaller waist and, and a much more voluptuous behind. And so I, didn't, I needed to make the waist smaller and do more dramatic increases for it to fit properly. In the end, it looked fabulous on her. There's a picture of her uh, wearing the skirt um, on my Ravelry page. If you want to scroll down and look, can't tell you exactly, but it was a lilac colored skirt and it really looks gorgeous on her. Um, and she's worn it over the years um, and it looks great. So, you know, there are things you have to, you kind of have to use a little bit of your, I'm, I'm going to say intuition because I don't know what else to say in terms of figuring out, you know, what's going to work for my body. Um, a skirt is a great thing uh, because honestly, this probably used about 600 yards. I think I used about three skeins of this yarn, not a whole lot. So, you know, it's not a huge project necessarily. It's certainly a lot smaller than a sweater. Like this probably took me a week to make, you know, with the little bit of time that I have to knit in the evenings. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really considering making another one like this. When I see the yarn that would work for a sweater skirt, I'll be making this, uh, again. Um, and I'll have to start over and calculate my calculations because 
I didn't take any notes. <laughs> and it'll be different yarn. So, um, you know, I'll have to take all of that into account as well. So yeah, so consider your materials, consider the waistband. Um, if it's a summer skirt, a little drawstring waistband is, is nice or an elastic band as well, especially with perhaps something wooly. This might be a nicer option. Um, and then, and then off you go to measuring everything. So hopefully that was helpful if you're interested in, in knitting a skirt at some point. Um, if you're intrigued by it, but you're not so sure you want to knit one for you, knit one for a younger person. For example, a kid. Um, you know, that's always an option. Um, and there are actually quite a few patterns on Ravelry. Uh, if, you, if you do a search for skirts, you'll find quite a few and there are lots of different shapes. So if you're more of an A-line person, um, I would suggest finding a pattern, um, but a, a straight skirt, really, it's, it's, it's really quite an easy thing. It's kind of a tube with a little bit of shaping. Um, so there you go. Hopefully that was helpful. I think that I will stop there today. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about sewing, um, but I think um, I had so much I want to share with you. In fact, I realized I haven't even talked about our cal yet. I better do that right now before I sign off. That would be terrible. But there has been so much going on uh, in the last month and a half um, and so much that I want to share. I'm realizing there are things around me that I haven't shown you. I'll have to keep them for next time. Um, in terms of acquisitions, uh, really the only thing that I bought was the yellow Gailsk yarn for, for the Sundoktir sweater. Um, I haven't bought anything else. I don't intend to buy a whole lot, but I'm going to talk about cow. About our knit along because there is a bit of acquisition for the cow, kind of. So, so we've got a knit along as well, uh, which I have there in my notes, but I completely missed. Um, and it's really been great. We have so many uh, finished objects at this point. I'm I'm blown away uh, by the beautiful things that people are making. There have been some dresses as well. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the orange skirt that the person's making when it's finally done. Uh, lots of beautiful sweaters. I've been so inspired and so thrilled with people's participation. Great chatting happening, people sharing with their progress on stuff. It's been such a joy. And um, I have been sharing this cow, this knit along. So this is a knit along. <laughs> why don't I start at the beginning? This is a knit along that started um, in October and it's going until the 31st of March. So we have about a month and a half left. It's called the Garments Galore Cal. That's the hashtag you can use on Instagram to post your projects if you like. And um, it's about garment knitting. Um, you know, it, it's meant to be for adults. Uh, there have been a couple of kids' sweaters and I haven't gotten upset about it just because they're, they're kids, you know, they're 10 year olds and 13 year olds who are practically adults anyway, in terms of sizing, but it's not meant to be for, for babies. It's meant to be for, for bigger people. And um, there are threads for, for uh, showing off your finished objects. There's also a thread in my group um, for your first sweater. And we've got a few entries there, which is awesome. Congratulations if you've knit your first sweater. Um, and, but I'm also co-hosting this knit along with my dear friend, Kate, who I've already mentioned, I think two or three times in this podcast. Um, and she's got a podcast called the Hawthorne Cottage Craft Podcast. And so she's got a garment galore cow going there as well. And she's also got a finished object thread, so you can you can double dip if you like. And she's got an extra thread. I have the first sweater. She's got the uh, Mount Everest sweater. So this is a sweater that requires more than 1,400 yards to knit. Um, and um, so she's got entries in there. So if you've knit something that's required that amount of yarn or more, feel free to um, post in her in her uh, thread as well. And she's got a chatter thread too. And so it's been really such a joy and getting to know people a little bit more as a result of this. And it's been really, really enjoyable. So I hope that those of you who are participating have enjoyed it as well. And uh, it's not too late if you, whips are welcome, which means works in progress. So if you have been working on something and you didn't realize that there was a knit along, you can post it. 
uh, works in progress, whether they were started before October or after our welcome. Um, in fact, I wanted uh, works in progress because sometimes we start a sweater and we kind of leave it to the side. And so this was a way for motivating people to, to get those sweaters done. And so uh, prizes, some more prizes have come in. I've sort of been showing, I think next time I'll really show all the prizes and kind of organize them a little bit. Um, but I did want to show you a little bit of uh, a beautiful um, gift that was sent for the knit along from Melissa of Wales Street Yarns. And I've got it in a, a little basket over here. She sent four skeins of yarn. One for me and three for you. Now we haven't talked about whether they're all for the knit this knit along or whether it would be so for something else, but they are just stunning, stunning, stunning yarns. I, 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 I opened the package and I was just like, oh my goodness, how am I supposed to choose which one I would keep? I mean, everybody probably thinks that I'll be keeping the pink and it's really, really beautiful, but I'm kind of intrigued by that one. This is really stunning. Anyway, they're, I, they're just so beautiful. This is her Merino um, nylon base. It's a two-ply fingering. There's 400 yards. And it's got, it's just a stunning yarn. It's really, really beautiful. So these, I'm gonna put a little picture here so you can pause and look a little bit more if you like. And then, um, so this will be part of a prize. I haven't quite figured out how I want to do that. So I'm going to do that next time I'll be sharing because we are coming close to the end of the knit along and you may be curious. Now, my mother-in-law, as you know, if you've been watching the podcast, my husband is from Uruguay and um, Malabrigo Yarns is in Uruguay, which I am able to, when we go to Uruguay, go to the factory and buy directly from there. Um, at a more reasonable price and they I've never actually bought um, Yarn that's meant for the market there. I've always bought from their extras bins um, And Malabrigo doesn't usually sell yarn in Uruguay. They make yarn for export so people in Uruguay um, I think the knitting culture in Uruguay has been a little bit more cotton acrylic based um, they don't have a huge indie dyeing yarn culture, uh, but I think that's probably been growing a little bit. And so now they have started selling um, here and there in Uruguay. And my mother-in-law was at a market of some sorts. I'm not sure if it was a craft market or what kind of market it was actually. I didn't ask her. And um, somebody had some Malabrigo yarn. Now, they told her it was Malabrigo yarn. It looks like Malabrigo yarn, but it doesn't have tags on it because I think maybe they're only using those for export. Um, the same thing happens with uh, Manos del Uruguay. Um, they will sell extras, for example, or some yarn here and there, but they don't have labels on it like they do here. So I'm not sure what that's about. It may have something to do with some laws or, um, they're, I'm not quite sure why they're doing that. So my mother-in-law said she bought some yarn for me and I thought, oh, how lovely. She bought me a couple of skeins of yarn. No, she didn't buy me and it, just a couple of skeins of yarn. Here for your viewing pleasure is a short video of all the yarn she bought. So that's a lot of yarn. And if you noticed, there were all kinds of colors in there, but there were two skeins of teal that I thought could be for the giveaway. But I might give the winner the choice. I haven't quite decided how to do that, but there's an awful lot of yarn there. <laughs> I was just not expecting, uh, I'm not, I haven't even counted how many skeins that was, but that was a lot of skeins. And some really fun colors in there. Um, so some of that will be part of the knit along prize as well. And then I may keep some for, for other prizes too. So um, Malabrigo yarn is a beautiful yarn to work with. I've made 
several things out of Malabrigo sock and always enjoy working it with it. Actually, my Arwen is out of it as well. So uh, yeah, so those are yarns that have come into my life that are geared towards the knit along. And um, so I promise next time to have all of that. And now I really do think it's time to go. This has been my longest episode ever. <laughs> and um, uh, there's so much that I could share and tell with you guys, but I think, you know, I'll stop here for today. And I'll try and podcast a little bit more sooner, or a little sooner so that I can indeed show you more things and start addressing some of the uh, comments and questions from the giveaway that we just did. So we'll see you again, hopefully soonish, and I'm wishing you a happy rest of February and happy crafting. I'm going to insert um, a little video of Yoda outside because I don't know how many times I've watched that video. She just, it's so adorable. So I'm gonna uh, end with that. And um, if you're a cat person, you'll enjoy it. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. You coming home? Hi. Hello, my love.